Good morning and welcome to the Grand Strand Church of Christ. We are glad that you are here. If you're visiting with us, either from out of town or in town, there are visitor's cards on the back of the pew in front of you. We'd love for you to fill one of those out. Tell us how we can serve you and then place it in the collection plate in the lobby as you exit this morning. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, we love you, we miss you. We look forward to you being back with us in person. Hey, keep in prayer our group of 30 from church here that are now at Palmetto Bible Camp. Uh, pray for God uh, to uh, just illuminate the hearts and souls of all of our young people uh, that are there. That's one of our big uh, points of emphasis here at church to make disciples of Jesus among the youngest. And so be in prayer for them that that happens. Also this week, I'd like you to be in prayer uh, for Joseph Rhodes and Barnul Russia, one of our mission partners. Uh, Joseph and his team have been about the business of making first generation Christians in Russia uh, through summer camps and those have kicked off and so just pray for God to be at work there as well as with our other uh, missions partner uh, Vladimir in Lithuania as you know they are supporting uh, a number of Ukrainian refugees and having opportunities to share the gospel with them so pray for that mission point as well Last but not least, I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming our newest church member to our family. She's not totally new. Uh, for several years, she bounced back and forth from Texas to the beach, uh, but now the beach is her permanent home. When you meet her, uh, you will be meeting a walking, living miracle. You might recall that we were in prayer for Jerry for a good while uh, and uh, doctors just didn't think she was going to make it through uh, that health crisis. But she's back to walking six miles a day and uh, just doing very well. I'm going to ask her to stand up where she is seated so you can turn around, look at her, and welcome her. This is Jerry Wiley.
the splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at morning church our scripture reading this morning comes from exodus 15 verses 1 through 3 then moses and the israelites sang this song to the lord i will sing to the lord for he is highly exalted both horse and driver he is hurled into the sea the lord is my strength and my defense he has become my salvation he is my god and i will praise him my father's god and i will exalt him the lord is a warrior the lord is his name let us pray dear heavenly father we thank you for allowing us to gather here today we ask that you guide and direct us throughout the week and allow the holy spirit to fill our hearts we pray and remember all those who have served and died and gone on before us in the military we pray for all the victims all the people who have been touched by the terrible tragedy in Eastern Europe. And we, we know that, dear Heavenly Father, that you are still and always at work. And we pray that, as always, there will be some good that comes from that, and it'll bring more people closer to the Lord. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. to meet Chris Wills. Uh, Chris and Vanessa uh, moved to the beach back in uh, the spring of 2020 and shortly after became a member of our church family. And Chris has just launched a nonprofit called Grand Strand Horses Healing Heroes, Inc., uh, which is located just a few uh, minutes away from our church building. And so to start off, Chris, tell us a little bit about your military career and what happened to bring it to an unfortunate end. Absolutely. Um, so I, I served as an active duty hospital corpsman in the Navy uh, for eight years from 2008 to 2016 and medically retired July 29th, 2016 from combat injuries sustained 
uh, in the field of combat uh, during the war in Afghanistan. Uh, my physical injuries in, occurred in 2011 due to a roadside bomb, uh, traumatic brain injury, knee, neck, lower spine injuries, as well as uh, mental health injuries, uh, mainly due to what I saw, uh, to what the enemy was doing to their own people and to uh, our soldiers. I was a combat medic, so I, I saw firsthand what uh, the unfortunate reality sure. was. So most of us have heard of PTSD, uh, but don't know what it is really like. So tell us what some of your symptoms were. So my symptoms were mainly lack of sleep, night sweats, shaking hands, uh, constantly on alert, depression, withdrawal from society, uh, and hallucinations. Actually, I remember one night when uh, early on after I got back from Afghanistan, Vanessa I guess I had fallen asleep on the couch and Vanessa during the middle of the night got up and noticed that I wasn't in bed and I had fallen asleep on the couch with the TV on so she came down, uh, shook me to wake me up and it triggered a physical reaction and I instinctively brought my fist up. Thankfully I was able to recognize that it was Vanessa and I was able to calm myself down. Right, right. So after being treated with an array of medications for PTSD and uh, even using alcohol to try to escape some of the emotional pain you live with, you met a horse named Silver uh, shortly after you moved here who had been abused as a young horse, um, was troubled, and was scheduled to be sent to a kill shelter. So how did that encounter change your life? Well, so from the, the moment I locked eyes with this horse, uh, I, could, I could feel his heart, and there was an instant connection. Uh, after I, after I brought, uh, bought him and began to spend time with him, uh, I realized my PTSD symptoms soon started becoming more manageable. Uh, little did I know at the time that there was a scientific explanation for this. I just knew that he loved me, he was always happy to see me, he never judged me, like some doctors, and uh, he never walked away from me, and always made me feel safe and secure. Uh, his behavior began to mirror my own emotional state, mm -hmm. and on any given day, which made me be aware of how I was feeling and alerted me to changes so that I would feel better. So your experience with Silver was the seed for Grand Strand Horses Healing Heroes, Inc., which features an eight-week equine therapy program uh, for veterans along the Grand Strand suffering from PTSD. So tell everybody a little bit about that. So right now we are losing 22 veterans a day uh, to suicide in America. That's 8,000 a year. We have 30,000 veterans living in Horry County. Uh, veterans are heroes and many of them are suffering because of the sacrifices they made for our country. And I want them to have the opportunity that I did to get better, and also an, uh, a holistic alternative to traditional Western medicine. This program is free of charge for veterans and their families. If anyone here this morning knows veterans in need of help, please tell them about this program. We have flyers and business cards in the lobby. And if you would uh, like to volunteer or donate to help this program succeed, I will be in the lobby after church to any answer questions. Well, Chris, we are all uh, proud of you in what you're doing to make a difference, to bless our community. We thank you uh, for your service to our country, and we just want to pray for you right now. Everybody, if you'll join me. Uh, Lord God, uh, thank you for writing Chris's story, and thank you, God, for the turns it's now taking as he seeks to bless those the way that you have blessed him. And so would you give uh, this ministry your blessing, Lord, that many might receive help and find comfort through it, and God continue to be uh, the faithful provider that Chris needs in his life all of his days. And God, as your people, we thank you for the freedom uh, that we are enjoying and celebrating this weekend. In the name of the Lord, amen. amen. Everybody thank Chris for sharing with us. Good job, man.
for communion, let us sing hallelujah, what a say. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scalding ruin. In my place, condemned he stood. Till my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then a new this song will sing, hallelujah. As we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper, a question comes to mind, I know we've heard many times, why do we do this? And there are many, many reasons we can come up with as to why we celebrate the Lord's Supper each Lord's Day. But to make it simple, and hopefully something you can remember as I remember, Jesus said it, and Jesus did it. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 15, Jesus with the apostles, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then after this, in verse 19, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, and listen to this, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In verse 20, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So when someone asks you that perhaps doesn't know, the easiest thing to say is, Jesus said it, and Jesus did it. Let's have a prayer for the uh, bread. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you gave your life on the cross for each and every one of us, that we would follow your example each and every Lord's day. Thank you for the suffering that you went through for us, and as we partake of these emblems, just help us to do so in a worthy manner, remembering that your body was given for us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Now have a prayer for the cup. Jesus, we thank you so much that you shed your blood on the cross for each and every one of us. That uh, you did this, that we might have life. We might have it everlasting. And just help us, Jesus, to use our life each and every day to be that Christian you would have us to be. Sharing uh, your word with others that we come in contact with that do not know you as Lord and Savior. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Redeem now I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of time we all been waiting for. No, really. Now, I don't want everybody to take off running right now. But for now we're going to send our youth to Bob to Sunday school and as they leave let us send them off in song. <laughs> Jesus loved the little children. All the children of the world ran black and white they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. For some time, I've been thinking about the rising popularity of tattoos in our culture. Um, way back when, uh, tattoos were by and large associated with sailors, prison inmates, and gang members, but now they are associated with everyday people and have entered mainstream society. Uh, about a third of all American young adults uh, have at least one tattoo. Uh, my daughter has more than one, and uh, you see grandmas and grandpas and pretty much all people groups represented by those who wear a tattoo. And so it's just gotten me to thinking uh, about the rising popularity and what explains it. Now, one option is uh, there was this uh, reality TV show back in the early 2000s, Tattooed Ink Something in Miami that may have been the bridge to help tattoos cross over in the mainstream society. But I was, I was listening to a, a well-known psychiatrist on a podcast a few months ago, and uh, he says that there is a certain personality type uh, that is drawn to uh, tattoos and the wearing of them. And they're called the creatives, people with sort of a creative personality or temperament and I thought, well, that explains it. Because I don't have a creative bone in my body, but my daughter is very creative. She draws, she paints. And so that helped me sort of understand what her attraction to tattoos were as opposed to my questioning of them. And it reminded me a few, this was a few years ago. Uh, we had a new person heading into our church building who had a tattoo you know, on her arm and a sleeveless shirt. And, I think it just hit her as she was approaching, and she, she asked if it was okay that she came in with a tattoo. And I said, well, yeah, we love people with tattoos, absolutely. And we love all kinds of people uh, in our church. But 
that got me to thinking about our series, Stories Jesus Told. Because you know me, if I want you to know something I think you should know, I'm probably going to give you three bullet points. <laughs> but if Jesus wants you to know something that he thinks you need to know, he's probably going to tell you a story. Because Jesus is a creative type of personality. And so this is uh, part three of this series. We're going to look at a third story that Jesus told. Uh, but before we do, I want to give you a preview of coming attractions to sort of increase your anticipation of this story. So in this story, uh, there are at least two storylines that uh, will intersect with our everyday lives. And the first is indifference. I mean, how many of you have sort of observed society and, and questioned why so many people seem to be indifferent about a lot of things? Like, a buddy of mine works at a home improvement store, and one day over lunch he was talking about some of his fellow employees who were pretty indifferent about their jobs. And I asked to explain how he knew that about them, and he said, and he had a list. He said, all right, number one, some of them don't show up for work or they show up late. Uh, number two, uh, they put their work phones or uh, walkie-talkies on silent so they can say, I never got the call. He said, number three, uh, they will tell customers uh, false pieces of information uh, just to get them moving along in the store, like where is something or what you really need for this job. And he said, uh, what am I at? Number four, number five. Um, whatever it is, he said, and then the one customers will come and talk to me about in relationship uh, to some of my fellow coworkers is they see indifference in their facial expressions. Like them, the customers are bothering them or inconveniencing them when they are approached to ask a question. Uh, you can probably tell whether it's a waiter or a waitress or somebody in a store or other places where people are indifferent about their jobs or if they really care about them and want to do a good job for you. So we see a lot of uh, examples of indifference in culture today. I've got a client, my client, that is my way of telling you this is not a church member. This is someone I work with in community as I do with a number of people. I've got a client who emailed me just a couple of weeks ago about her church. And she said, uh, everybody seems to be indifferent to my situation. I'm like, please explain how you came to that conclusion. She said, email. Everybody knows about my situation and the things I'm going through. And no one, the preacher or any church member, ever asked me about my situation. Like, no care. No concern, just seemingly indifferent to the situation. I think it was after World War II that someone said this, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Indifference. Okay, so if you've ever been on the receiving end of indifference or in your walk with Christ, as you faced a difficult situation, ever thought that maybe God was indifferent to your situation? Uh, look for that storyline in this story. Now, the second storyline to look for in this story that Jesus told is discouragement. Now, I had a favorite professor in college who, in the middle of a lecture, out of nowhere, because this was a, a class on Greek, he taught me uh, common Greek from the old days. And so out of the blue, he stopped and said this, that just still sticks with me today. He said, one of Satan's greatest weapons against us is discouragement. And that probably caught my mind because, you know, I battled discouragement. I already by that time had battled depression. And uh, apparently my professor had as well. Uh, sometime long after I graduated from college, I heard the story that, story that he actually ended his life, committed suicide. And so discouragement sometimes leads people to give up. Give up on living or give up on other things in life. Like 
If you've ever gone on a diet and you haven't lost the weight you wanted to lose fast enough, you get discouraged, right? And sometimes we just uh, chuck the diet. Or um, if you've been really uh, working hard on the job for that promotion and you haven't gotten it yet, you get discouraged and you think about giving up. Or if you've made sacrifices in a relationship that haven't been reciprocated, you start to think, well, what's the point? You get discouraged and you give up. So if you've ever experienced discouragement to the point of wanting to give up, look for that element in this story that Jesus told. All right, you ready to hear this story? Your anticipation is high. Um, well, not yet. Because before Jesus told this story, Luke includes an introductory statement. There it is. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Now, I love that disclaimer because someone like me needs a heads up as to what to look for. Otherwise, I just might miss the point of the story. And so Luke is saying, okay, this story is about prayer and not giving up. So one sign of giving up as followers of Jesus, is when we stop praying on a regular basis. And so Jesus is going to tell us a story that communicates how important it is for us to communicate with God on a regular basis to pray and not give up. Now, in Luke chapter 17, before this statement is made, Luke records words from Jesus about Jesus' concern for people in the past who have, in fact, given up on God. He cites two historical examples. One took place in the days of Noah. In that period of time, Jesus says, everybody went about their business having given up on God and were unprepared for the judgment of God to come upon them in the form of rain. In flooding. Example two took place in the days of Lot, where again, people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah had given up on God, just did their own thing, and were therefore unprepared for the judgment of God that rained down before them or on them in the form of uh, fire and brimstone. So Jesus is, has this concern for people who have given up on God, which makes them unprepared for the work of God in their lives. Then he tells this story, and then after he tells this story, Jesus makes this statement. Here it is. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, giving up means we no longer pray, and giving up means we no longer believe, or more specifically, trust in God. And Jesus is asking this question because he is concerned that when he comes again, uh, there will be an absence of faith in the lives of people who remain when he returns. And so this story is all about encouraging us to pray and not give up. Are you ready for the story? I'm not. <laughs> One more thing. Now, I'm going to take you all the way back to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke before this story is shared in chapter 18. Because Luke is methodical about describing Jesus' prayer life for us, his disciples. And because Jesus is our rabbi, our teacher in life, and it is our goal in life to do what our teacher did, Luke starts to outline Jesus' prayer life. So did you know that when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, right before the Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him, that Jesus was actually praying. That's right. And then when you get to Luke chapter 4, as Luke is describing Jesus' rising popularity, Jesus in turn, Luke says, often withdrew to lonely or isolated places where he would pray. And then when you get to Luke chapter 6, before Jesus chose his 12 apostles, he went up on a mountain, Luke says, 
and spent the whole night praying before he came down and chose his 12 apostles. And then before Jesus asked that very famous question that led to that very famous answer, the question was, who do men say that I am? Peter responded, um, we believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Before Jesus ever asked that question, Luke writes, Jesus was praying. And then when Jesus took his three closest companions up on another mountain, right before Jesus was transfigured and his appearance was changed before their very eyes, guess what Jesus was doing? Jesus was praying. What is Luke telling us? Jesus never gave up. And he always prayed. Was Jesus ever discouraged? You bet. Was Jesus ever confronted with indifference in society? Quite often. Yet in the face of indifference and in the face of discouragement, Jesus prayed and never gave up. One more thing before we look at the story. I got to ask. Why are there times when we, you, and I lack passion for and commitment to prayer? Why are there times when prayer is absent in our lives longer than it ever should be? And maybe for a few of you, this has never happened. But for myself and for others, it has. Where prayer has taken less and less a role in our lives. How do we explain that? I'll give you three explanations. One is independence. You see, prayer is a declaration of dependence upon God. But I can't and I don't want to do life without God, depending on him. And so the absence of prayer is a declaration of independence from God. We begin to lean on our own understanding rather than on God's, and we begin to march through life in our own power rather than depending on the power of God after having prayed to the Lord. This was a few years ago, probably right before COVID, when you could still get into hospitals. And I was in the elevator to go upstairs to see someone, and uh, it hit me. Jay, it's been a while since you've ever thought about praying before entering one of these very delicate situations. And I guess it was probably because, well, I've done this for years and I've developed the skills and abilities to handle these situations. And so I've just done them depending upon me rather than praying first and depending upon God. And so if you're like me, maybe you've had times where you've lived independently of God, never stopped believing in God, but it's a sort of face life in your own power without having first prayed to God and depended upon God. So that's number one. Number two is impatient. Boy, are we impatient. I read this book years ago called uh, too busy not to pray. We're all so busy. Everybody is busy. And oftentimes we're too busy to pray. But when you think about all of the things that we're involved in, how dare we get involved in them without praying through them? And so many of us just lack patience and prayer demands patience. Because when we pray first, we wait upon the Lord for leadership and, and guidance and direction, and that takes time. We don't feel like we have that time, so we just stop praying and we just start acting. And then finally, number three, prayerless people are faithless people, meaning they just stop trusting God with their lives. Philip Yancey wrote a book titled Prayer. Does it make any difference? Really good read that addresses a lot of our sort of challenges uh, with living or having a healthy prayer life. He writes this. Some who attempt prayer never have the sense of anyone listening 
on the other end. They blame themselves for doing it wrong. Prayer requires the faith to believe that God listens. One reason why we stop praying is because we stop believing that God listens. A prayerless life is a faithless life. We stop trusting in God. And so Jesus tells this story that we're really about to read now because he's seen this happen in humanity for all of human history. People who give up, stop praying, and give up on God. So instead of giving you three bullet points for why you should never give up and always pray, that's what I would do, he tells this very creative story. Here it is, Luke 18, verse 2. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I don't know about you, but for a long time I read this story and drew all of the wrong applications to it. I read this story and said to myself, oh, I've got to be like that widow because God is like that unjust judge. And so my attitude about prayer should be, Lord, I'm going to pester you and pester you and pester you until you finally have had enough with me, are ready to listen to my concerns, and then act accordingly uh, like I would prefer you to. I mean, I actually had that attitude one morning in my 20s uh, on the front pew of the church I was working for on a Monday morning. I was discouraged. And I said, Lord, all right, I'm going to be here every morning. I'm going to wear you out until you finally do something about this. You, you see what's wrong? How Jesus' story is anything but the application that I took from it? Here's how. This story is actually a study in opposites. The unjust judge, or let's just call him the judge, the judge in the story is selfish. But God, the God that you're worshiping this morning, the Jesus that you follow every day, you know he is selfless. The judge in the story couldn't care about people, couldn't care about God. The only one he cares about is himself. And we rub elbows with people like this all of the time in this world. Don't care about anyone or anything but themselves. But God, God is one who is completely selfless. Scripture says Jesus left heaven for earth and became poor so we might become rich. Jesus said, I didn't come to the earth to be served by people, but to serve people and to give my life away for them. When the Apostle Paul writes about Jesus taking on human flesh and becoming a servant to us, he then cites that Jesus died. How selfless is that? And then he like underlines the next statement, even death on a cross. That's how selfless God is. You don't have to pester God in order to get God to hear your prayers. 
He's not selfish like the unjust judge. He is the opposite. He's selfless. Number two, this judge is indifferent. God is compassionate. I mean, the judge is indifferent to the widow's plight. She's got a raw deal, and she is being taken advantage of. He just doesn't care. He has no concern for her situation. The idea that God could be like that, <laughs> doesn't care about you, isn't interested in your situation, is totally the opposite of what the Bible does in describing God himself. Jesus put it this way. He said, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And Jesus, as he moved from town to town, to village to village, was compassionate all of the time and related to people's concerns and interests all of the time. The unjust judge, indifferent. Your God, just the opposite, compassionate. Finally, number three, this judge is unjust. God is just. Even when this judge in the story acts upon the widow's behalf, it doesn't make him a just judge because he's not doing it for the sake of justice. He's doing it for the sake of himself. Jesus says, if this guy will finally, finally act on her behalf, the God you all know and follow will always act every time on your behalf. Jesus uses the word quickly. He will act quickly on your behalf. But you know, my word quickly in the Bible could mean five years. Could mean 25 years. Could mean 150 years. Jesus is saying God is just all of the time and God will always mete out justice. Maybe not in my time, but by the end of time, every act of injustice will be held in account. He will never close his eyes and pretend like that didn't happen because God is a just God. And so, do you know what kind of people are praying people? They are people like the widow, needy people. You know, widows in Jesus' time were like, almost totally dependent upon society for their basic needs. In this patriarchal society that they lived in, they were often taken advantage of and abused. So they needed someone to fight for them and to take care of them. Widows were needy people. That's why she's asking and she's asking. And maybe the reason why you're not asking is because you've lost your sense of neediness in your own spirit. You've begun to believe that you don't need Jesus as much as you used to. You can fly solo and do your thing now because of what you did with Jesus 10 years ago. Wow, you've got to repent. You've got to confess your neediness before God. In fact, you can't really be a Christian unless you have this deep sense of neediness within your own spirit because Jesus said the first beatitude... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven isn't for people who think they've got their act all together and they don't need any help. The kingdom of heaven is only for people who realize how poor they are on the inside and are desperately in need of Jesus' help. So praying people are needy people. Praying people are also prepared people. We don't know what the future holds, but you know the rest of the statement. We know who holds the future, right? And so when somebody gets on TV and says, hey, the world's going to end next week, you and I go, well, all right. And we go about our business. <laughs> because we're prepared people. Praying people are prepared people. And so whenever that time is, we're ready. But praying people aren't just prepared for like the end of time. They are prepared for any time. I've seen it. 
praying people who were actually prepared for cancer before they knew they were going to have cancer. But when it came, they were prepared. Praying people who were prepared for loss of job or political upheaval long before it came. But when it came, they were prepared because they were already praying people. And finally, praying people are trusting people. You see how Jesus ties prayer to faith or trust? Which means prayerless people. You know, if you can go days and weeks without praying, you become a faithless person. But people who, when they get out of bed every morning, say, Lord, this day is yours. Show me your way. I need you this day. Those kind of praying people, they're faithful, trusting people. I love the people in my life who, like, they just pray all the time. And they amaze me. Like, for them, any good time or any time is a good time to stop and pray. Like, uh, it's about a month ago, a buddy of mine and I are out for lunch, and it was like during that lunch that I got really uncomfortable. It turned out to be a kidney stone, but like, as lunch went on, it was like hard. I told him, I think I got something here. So we finished lunch, and we're walking to our cars in the parking lot. And he stops me out in the middle of the parking lot for everybody to see. Puts his arm around me and just starts praying over me. I wish I was more like him. Just was ready to pray over people. Anytime, any moment. And then... Before uh, my former secretary's funeral service uh, a few weeks ago, uh, first Sal and then Pam at the door, they stopped me and they each say, without having talked to each other, we know this is going to be really hard for you. And each one just started praying <laughs> over and right there. While everything else is going around, they're like, this is the time to pray. And we've got a church member, Mr. Tom. Sometimes he shows up mid-morning just to come in and pray over me and then go about his business of playing pickleball or whatever else he's going to do the rest of the day. Like, these are people who believe. They believe. I'm not going to say they believe in prayer. I'm saying they believe in God. And because they believe in God, they believe in prayer. May we be the kind of people this week, as our group comes to lead us in the song of decision, may we be the kind of people this week who depend upon God and not ourselves by praying and talking to God throughout our week. I'm hoping that God in his spirit is talking to someone's spirit this morning. I mean, whoever that someone is, that, that you respond inwardly, and talk to God while we're singing and standing, but you're talking to God and connecting to God. But, but maybe there's someone here who needs the people of God to like embrace them, pray over them, encourage them, or maybe someone's ready to be baptized in the Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and become a disciple. If we can help you in any of those ways, this is serious. We really want to help. We've got the time. You'll meet me down front here and tell us how we can help as together we stand and sing. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need. Restore my heart. Stir my desire.
right, thank you, Brother Jay, for that message. Before we have our closing prayer, let us notice our last hymn, Our God, He is Alive. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, do me a favor, real quickly. Everybody smile. <laughs> now I can say it. It's really good to see your smiling faces here this morning. It's, uh, it's uplifting to see everybody here. If you're visiting with us because you're on vacation, you're a superstar. And we're glad you're here. And uh, we hope that you'll spend a couple seconds talking to us after services. And maybe we can point you at a couple of good restaurants or something. If you're from the uh, community and you're looking for a church, well, you have found it right here. This is about as good a church you're going to find on the Strand. We are a tight family, and we love to love. So be a part of us. Uh, Chris is going to be outside here in the lobby, so please remember that. Also remember that you can't pick up the kids for about 15 more minutes. So if you've got kids, we've got them held hostage back over here for another 15 more minutes. So that will give you a chance to talk to people. So uh, please avail yourself of that. And uh, would you bow with me and we'll go ahead and close out. Our Lord and Father, this weekend we're very much reminded of freedom. We're also very much aware of what the cost of that is. And we heard a little bit of that this morning. But Father, as we celebrate our freedom, we'd ask that we do so responsibly. And that, Father, that you watch over us and that you keep us safe through all of that. But as we come here this morning, as we do every Sunday, we're also reminded of the freedom that we receive through Christ. Paul makes it very clear in so many different ways and so many different statements that our lives are different because of what Christ did. That we have your grace, and Father, and we can enjoy that freedom that comes with that. And Father, that freedom comes also with responsibilities, responsibilities of prayer, responsibilities of love for each other, and the extension of that same level of grace to the people around us. And, 